Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be looking at uh, the first part of specific resistance to infection and we're going to be specifically looking at B lymphocytes or B cells. Alright, so in this lesson your key terminology that you need to know are B cells or B lymphocytes, you can call them either or. There's another category called T lymphocytes which we will discuss in the next um, lesson. I'm just going to have a little recap on what lymph is and lymphoid tissue and the lymph nodes and those structures associated. That does include the thymus, which um, is in your thoracic cavity next to your heart. And we're going to be looking at something called the humoral or antibody mediated response. That involves things called antigens and antibodies. All right, so these are your learning intentions for this lesson. Uh, please make sure you're familiar with that and that you can achieve each point by the end of it. So a quick overview of immunity. So we talked about the non-specific responses such as the first and second line of defense. So we've discussed the, the physical barriers to letting pathogens into the body and the non-specific um, immune responses such as inflammation, fever and phagocytosis. We're going to use some of that information and apply it to the next part of the course and that's looking at specific immunity. So this type of immunity uses specialized white blood cells called lymphocytes. These lymphocytes are very sophisticated and they can help to defend your body against viruses. So before we actually understand how that works, we need to have a look at some basic information relating to key terminology. So one of the words in our list that we had to look at were antigens. Now, antigens are really important, and you'll remember this from year 11. They can be self-markers. Now, when it says MHC, you don't really need to know what that is. That's, that stands for Major Histocompatibility Complex. We can just ignore that and call it a self-marker. These antigens um, are what all your body has, and it allows your body to recognize cells that belong to it. You also um, have non-self antigens, and this is a really clever way that your body has evolved to um, use, and that um, allows it to recognize any antigens that don't belong to it. So for the most part, this works perfectly and we're fine. However, sometimes this can lead to autoimmune disorders uh, such as type 1 diabetes, where we don't recognize our own body cells and we start to attack them. So an antigen is a substance that is capable of causing an immune response. Typically, those are the non-self antigens that do that. So normally, these antigens are either protein or carbohydrate based. That's what a polysaccharide is. However, sometimes they can be lipid or nucleic acid based. Antigens can be viral particles or even part of a pathogen such as the flagella of a bacterium or its cell wall. The um, antigens can also be the toxins that are secreted or produced by bacteria. They don't actually necessarily have to be the organism itself. And like I said, we have self antigens, which our body produces to recognize its own cells. And there are non self antigens, which we recognize as foreign and which allow us to trigger this immune response. Okay, so on the other side of the coin, when you have antigens, you also have antibodies. So this little graphic here shows how antibodies and antigens can combine with each other. You can see from this diagram that antibodies are quite specialized. They have receptor sites that are very specific to a certain type of antigen. So these um, surfaces match up in a very complementary way, very similar to enzymes. Um, and you can see that this antigen will not combine with this antibody because they are not complementary surfaces.
So antigens and antibodies um, need to be complementary to each other in order to work, and antibodies are made of protein. That's something that you need to know. Okay, so how does this relate to the immune system? Well, the specific defenses that we've been talking about um, will um, elicit a response from a particular um, type of lymphocyte, that is B or T cells. This is classed as the third line defense. And this is because we are using a highly specialized mechanism of lymphocytes and they are derived from lymphoid tissue. And we'll talk about what lymphoid tissue is later. So this type of immune response is very sophisticated because in the last picture we showed you that the antibody and the antigen receptor sites are complementary to each other. So we have to find a way of making that work. And that involves a specific antibody reacting to a specific antigen. Okay, so this slide is just to help you recap that terminology that we've talked about. If you want to, you can pause the video and make a note of this, draw your own diagram, make sure that you understand these keywords. All right, so the overall immune response can be divided up into two separate types of response. We have the cell mediated response, which we'll talk about in the next lesson. And in this lesson, we're going to focus on the antibody mediated or humoral response. Now that response um, talks about the production of antibodies and the prevention of any pathogens before they get into cells. So that's really important. We're talking about preventing pathogens from invading our cells. That's a big distinction between the humoral response and the cell mediated one. Another big difference is that the antibody or humoral response uses B lymphocytes and these are produced and mature in the bone marrow. Okay, so this diagram here, we're not really going to be focusing on all the different parts of it. This part, part down here, which is turning blue, the bone marrow, that's what we're going to be focusing on in the humoral response, because that is to do with B lymphocytes. B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow and they're also made there. And that's really important to know. Okay, so like I said, B lymphocytes or B cells are made in the bone marrow, the same as T cells. However, they also mature here. So B lymphocytes mature in the bone marrow. Following that maturation process, they will go to lymphoid tissue. So that's the, the lymphatic system where they will circulate. And just to give you um, a direct um, definition, lymphoid tissue is considered to be the cells and organs that make up that lymphatic system. And um, that also incorporates organs such as the thymus, which we've mentioned, the spleen and lymph nodes, which we've talked about in a previous lesson. OK, so the thymus, this is where the T lymphocytes are produced, sorry, where they mature. So the T lymphocytes are made in the bone marrow with the B lymphocytes. The B lymphocytes will stay there and mature. However, the T lymphocytes move to the thymus where they mature. And this maturation process is really important when we start talking about the other type of immune response. This is a location where T cells become educated, as it were, regarding um, your body's own antibodies and antigens. So it, sorry, antigens, my mistake. It ensures that we don't attack ourselves and that we only attack foreign antigens. Again, these T cells will go to the lymphatic tissue where they will circulate around the body. All right, so in this diagram, what we are showing are the two routes that these B and T cells take in order to get to that lymphatic or lymphoid tissue. 
At number one, we can see that they both start off in the bone marrow as undifferentiated lymphocytes. The B cells remain in this bone marrow and they will mature. Once they have matured, they will migrate towards that lymph tissue and they will um, get to lymph nodes. The T cells, on the other hand, are simply made in the bone marrow and they will migrate towards the thymus where they undergo their own differentiation process and they will then migrate to the lymphatic system where they will transport around the body um, and look out for any infection. All right, so just as a little aside, um, what would happen if you didn't have a thymus? Some people have to have this organ removed. Well, it can actually lead to lots of problems. First of all, the T cells will not mature properly and you will have an issue with your um, lymphocyte count in your blood. If there's a deficiency in the antibody formation, then this can have serious consequences for your immune system. So it's actually something that's really important for your body. <clears throat> okay, so this diagram just shows the overall processes of the cell mediated response, which is the T cell response. But we're going to actually focus on the humoral response or the B cell response. And this is to do with antibodies. So this cartoon is just to show you an overview of what goes on, and we're going to discuss that in more detail. So to start with, our response to infection occurs in the same way. If a bacteria or some other pathogen has entered your body, then the phagocytes will migrate towards it, they will engulf it and digest it. Crucially, what they do to alert your body that there may be a bigger problem is that they present parts of that bacterium's antigens on the surface of the phagocyte cell. So you can see here that these little red dots, these are the antigens from the bacteria that invaded your body. And this phagocytic cell, this macrophage, displays these antigens on the surface. And it's doing that because it's trying to get your B and T cells to come and sort out the problem. So the antigen presenting cell, that's the phagocyte that we saw on the previous slide, moves towards the lymphoid tissue. And it does this because that is where the B and T cells are. And in order to get things going, there is a specific type of T cell called a helper T cell that recognizes the non-self antigen that has been bought to that lymphoid tissue. And that helper T cell does what the name describes. It goes and calls for help. That helper T cell releases chemicals. That's how it calls for help and it activates the B and or T cells to bring about their response. So just to recap, this is our foreign pathogen and these little spikes on the surface are its foreign antigens. Our macrophage engulfs and destroys that pathogen by phagocytosis, but that's just one. It destroys that pathogen however it does present the antigen on the surface of its cell this macrophage becomes an antigen presenting cell the macrophage will then migrate toward, towards the lymphoid tissue where it meets a helper t cell the helper t cell alerts the b cells and the t cells that something has gone wrong by releasing special chemicals called cytokines. Cytokines will initiate a response from the B and T cells, and we will have the star of the humoral and the cellular response. Okay, so in this lesson, as I said, we're going to be focusing on what B cells do. Now, B cells make antibodies.
So that's why this is called the antibody mediated response um, and sometimes known as the humoral response. And you should know both of those terms. So just um, as a point that's important for you to know, the humoral or antibody mediated response is really effective against bacteria bacterial toxins and viruses, but all of these things they're effective against are outside of the body cells, not inside cells. Okay, so what's actually happening is that these B cells that have never met um, a foreign antigen, when they get that signal from the helper T cells, they will start to find the right receptors that match the antigen. So once they have done that, they are able to bind with specific antigens. And once they've become specific, they can't go back. And like I said, B cells defend against free antigens, such as toxins and bacteria outside of the cell. So that's a really key difference. This is a little cartoon to show you what goes on. I would recommend having a look at that now pausing the video, reading it, and then coming back to that at the end. This is another cartoon of what happens, but we're just going to talk about this in different steps. Okay, so step one, the macrophage has phagocytosed or destroyed the bacterium. It presents these antigens on its cell surface. So the macrophage becomes the antigen presenting cell. Okay, so in this diagram, we can see that our pathogen has been engulfed by our phagocytic cell. It then, this phagocytic cell becomes the antigen presenting cell because it displays its antigens, sorry, the pathogen's antigens on the cell surface and it migrates towards the lymphoid tissue. In the lymphoid tissue, it meets a helper T cell and that helper T cell recognizes this foreign antigen. The helper T cell releases special chemicals called cytokines and that activates B cells. So we're going to talk about what happens in the rest of these stages. So we talked about the presentation steps, so we can move on from that. That's just another diagram to show you how this works. And we're going to look at activation. So the first thing that happens is that these helper T cells release cytokines that stimulate and activate B cells to start multiplying rapidly by mitosis. So they produce a whole suite of a clone of identical cells. So the first thing that happens to B cells is that they clone themselves. The second stage is that some of those clone cells become plasma cells. Now plasma cells are really important and we're going to talk about them in a second. But plasma cells are what some of those clone cells become. Others become memory cells. So this diagram here shows what happens. So we have got the cytokines initiating the B cells. B cells start to clone themselves. Some of those cells become plasma cells and some become memory cells. Now, if you look at this diagram, the plasma cells are secreting these Y-shaped antibody proteins. So you need to know that plasma cells make antibodies. So we can see in this diagram, we have got our clone by mitosis and production of antibodies. When these antibodies mix with the antigen, they are now specific to that antigen. They have been specially manufactured to combine with it in that complementary way, and they will inactivate the activity of the bacterium or whatever other pathogen that was there. So this process here 
is how B cells work. They will inactivate or deactivate the pathogen by combining with it. So the B cells, um, they will proliferate at a rapid rate by mitosis. Some of those cells will become plasma cells and some become memory cells. The plasma cells produce antibodies and the memory cells stay in reserve with that specific knowledge of that receptor site. So they remember the shape of that antigen. So these memory cells can make antibodies very, very quickly. So finally, once the B cells have deactivated or inactivated um, the pathogen, more macrophages will come along and engulf them by phagocytosis and destroy them. This diagram here just summarizes what happens. I would suggest that you pause the video at this point and have a very good look at this to understand what's going on. All right, so there are four specific ways that antibodies inactivate antigens, and we would expect you to be able to understand and discuss these. So the first one is neutralization of the antitoxin. So an antibody is produced against a specific toxic substance. Remember that toxins can be produced by bacteria or viruses. Um, and once these have been neutralized, they can be phagocytized. This um, neutralization reaction can also stop bacteria and viruses from adhering to surfaces. So remember that bacteria have got a slime layer on them that allows them to adhere to surfaces really well. This neutralization action prevents that from happening. The second method is agglutination, which I showed you in the previous slide. If I just go back to that, this is agglutination or clumping together. So these um, antibodies will bind to antigens and cause that agglutination or clumping. And this prevents the bacteria from reproducing and it also enhances the process of phagocytosis because the macrophage can migrate towards that clump and engulf the whole thing. Third one is antibody binding. Some surface antigens can um, cause repulsion from the phagocyte. So what that means is that the pathogen's antigens will try and deter the phagocyte from coming close to it. The antibody binding will hold that bacteria in place so the macrophage can come and engulf it. It gets around that defense mechanism. And the fourth one is lysis. So what happens in lysis is the antigen and the antibody complex that's been formed activates this protein that essentially punches holes in the cell membrane. Because you have these large holes in the cell membrane, it will cause the contents of that cell to rush out and that causes lysis. In this diagram here, in this flow chart, you can see all the different methods by which um, that pathogen is defeated. And here we've got a summary of what's going on. So here's a little flow diagram. Um, please make sure you take the time to read this carefully um, and see if you can make your own flow diagram and um, response of what's going on. Okay, guys, that's the end of the lesson. Thank you very much. Please make sure that you're up to date with all your notes. Make sure your booklets are filled out and you've read the relevant pages in your textbook.